The Psychology of Money. Chapter 1 No One is Crazy. Many of us think of financial decision making as a hard science. Whether in corporate boardrooms or in our private lives, we assume that if we put data into an equation, we'll know what to do. But in the real world, most people don't make financial decisions based on cold, hard numbers. Instead, we ask our friends for advice, check the news for economic predictions, or listen to our gut. After covering the 2008 crisis, investor and former Wall Street Journal columnist Morgan Housel discovered the underlying emotion in money management. And he realized that successful money management often has more to do with how you behave than with what you know. In his book, The Psychology of Money, Housel outlines various lessons on the biases and blind spots that can lead to bad money management. In the following chapters, you'll uncover a few common misconceptions that may be limiting your financial skills. Key idea Every financial decision we make is based on our personal experiences and our worldview. Although our personal experiences account for little of what's happened in the world, they make up the majority of how we think the world works. For example, if you were born in the 1990s, inflation has always been so low that you may think it's a non-issue. But if you were born in the 1960s, the inflation you saw in your teens and 20s has affected how you think of the economy. Ultimately, we make financial decisions based on these personal experiences and how they affect our worldview. Because of this, sometimes people make financial decisions that make little sense to the rest of us. They're making decisions based on the information they have, which may be different than what we have. So Housel argues, people do some crazy things with money. But no one is crazy. Retirement is a good example. Before World War II, Americans generally worked until they died. Then came Social Security. The first check cashed in 1940, adjusted for inflation, was worth just $416 in today's dollars. Eventually, people began to view retirement as an important investment, but that change took time. In fact, the 401k did not exist until 1978 and the Roth IRA until 1998. But by the end of 2018, the US had $27 trillion in retirement accounts. However, because retirement is still novel, many of us struggle to save up for it. But, remember, none of us are crazy. Our financial decisions are shaped by the world we live in, and as we'll see, things can take a while to change. Next, discover a financial strategy you may have overlooked that is guaranteed to help you make money. The Main Ideas, Chapter 1. Our financial decisions are based on our personal experiences and how they modify our worldview. Financial decision-making isn't necessarily a hard science and can be impacted by emotions and nuance. Each of us has a unique worldview, so none of us are crazy, regardless of how we make financial decisions. Chapter 2 Compounding Warren Buffett is one of the most successful investors of all time. But surprisingly, $81.5 billion of Warren Buffet's $84.5 billion net worth was earned after his 65th birthday. Housel explains how Buffett obtained such an incredible fortune so late in life, he started investing early. By investing from an early age, Buffet was able to reap the benefits of compounding. Compounding is a process whereby the interest earned on an original investment, as well as the interest that accrues from that interest, grow over time. For example, imagine you invest $10,000 at 5% interest. After one year, your initial investment would accrue $500. Then the next year, your total of $10,500 would compound at 5% interest, earning you another $525. Thus, you've made money off your initial investment, as well as the principal interest earned. Key idea We often overlook the potential of compounding because it's unintuitive. Many of us don't realize how drastic compounding's results can be because they are unintuitive. But compounding can help you increasingly make more money as time goes on. To further explore the benefits of compounding, let's consider a world in which Buffett's wealth had not compounded. As of 2020, Buffett is 90 years old and started investing when he was 10 years old. When he turned 30, Buffett's net worth was $1 million, roughly $9.3 million in 2020 dollars. In this alternate world, imagine Buffett tapped into his funds in his 20s, causing his net worth at 30 to dip to $25,000, rather than $1 million. 
Buffett continued to generate the same annual investment returns he generates in the real world, 22%. Then, he retired at 60. In this alternate world, what would Buffett's net worth be today? $11.9 million. That's 99.9% .9 less than his current net worth, $84.5 billion. Housel argues that Buffett's use of time is the secret to his fortune, and arguably matters more than his high returns. For example, consider hedge fund manager Jim Simons. He's compounded money at 66% annually since 1988, a rate one-third higher than Buffett. And yet, Simons' net worth is 21 billion, 75% less than Buffett's. How is this possible? It's because unlike Buffett, Simons did not hit his investment stride until his 50s, Housel explains. If he had invested for the same amount of time that Buffett did, Housel says his worth would be 63 quintillion 900 quadrillion 781 trillion 780 billion 748 million 160 thousand dollars. This highlights the tremendous effect of compounding, and why we shouldn't be so quick to overlook it. The Main Ideas, Chapter 2 Although the results of compounding are unintuitive, they shouldn't be overlooked. Compounding is a process where you can make money off of your money. The key to Warren Buffett's financial success is likely his use of time. Chapter 3 Long Tales Many of us are wary of financial failure. We think that if we make a mistake, it could affect us for the long term. Housel argues this isn't necessarily the case, even with a few mistakes, you can still make a fortune. For example, in the 1930s future art dealer Heinz Bergeron began acquiring a vast art collection. In 2000, he sold part of his collection of Picassos, Bracks, Clays, and Matisses to the German government. It was privately valued at over $1 billion. How was he able to acquire so many masterpieces? Housel explains, the great art dealers bought everything they could. Then they sat and waited for a few winners to emerge. In other words, Bergeron bought a lot of art, knowing that even if 99% of what he purchased was useless, 1% might contain a masterpiece. Key idea a small number of events can lead to the majority of the outcome. Bergeron's success highlights the importance of long tails, the farthest ends of a distribution of outcomes, Housel explains. The effect of long tails is often underestimated, but Housel argues that a small number of events can lead to the majority of the outcome. In this case, the long tails of Bergeron's masterpieces led to his ultimate fortune. The effect of long tails aren't exclusive to art and affect business and investing in a similar way. As an example, consider Amazon. Even though it's just one company, it drove 6% of the S&P 500's returns in 2018. Its growth came primarily from two tail events, Prime and Web Services. These are the 1% that make up for the 99% of Amazon's less successful projects, like the Fire Phone or travel agencies. Similarly, Apple contributed 8% of the S&P 500's returns in 2018. And although Apple also has had many failed projects, the iPhone is the tail event that's driven most of its success. Despite the prevalence of long tails, most of us don't take them into account. This can lead us to overreact when things fail. We don't realize that even if 99% of what we do fails, there is a chance 1% will succeed. Moving forward, you can embrace the knowledge that it's okay to be wrong sometimes, things will likely still work out. The Main Ideas, Chapter 3 A small number of events can be the cause of the final outcome. Long tails, or the farthest ends of the distribution outcomes, are often overlooked even though they can account for the majority of the final result. Even if 99% of projects fail, 1% can still lead to success. Chapter 4 Everything Has a Price Housel compares investing in the stock market to buying a car. When you want to get a new car, you have three options, buy it new, buy it used, or steal it. Most people would avoid stealing, since its consequences outweigh the value of getting a free car. But somehow, when it comes to the stock market, people do think they can steal. They try to get the rewards without paying the price. Or they pick the equivalent of a used car instead, which is an asset that is lower risk and thus lower reward. But, Housel explains, if you want the reward, you have to pay the price. With investing, the price you pay isn't just in dollars or cents, but rather accepting the volatility and fear that comes with an investment. 
So in this case, stealing the car would be trying to sell stock before a dip and trying to buy again before a big boom. For example, let's say you want to earn an 11% annual return for the next 30 years in preparation for your retirement. The Dow Jones Industrial Average returned at a high rate, about 11% per year, from 1950 to 2019. But during this time, the returns also fluctuated up and down dramatically. For most people, watching their investments value yo-yo can be devastating. So in this scenario, you might panic and try to steal the car. But what reward could you get if you accept the price of volatility and fear? Key idea you need to accept the fear and volatility of the stock market if you want a big reward. Consider three imaginary investors named Sue, Jim, and Tom who each invest $1 in the stock market every month from 1900 to 2019. Sue invests her $1 every month, come rain or shine, recession or prosperity. She pays the price of the fluctuating market. Jim is a bit more skittish. When a recession hits, he takes his stock out of the market and reinvests when the recession ends. Tom takes more time to adjust. He waits until six months after a recession begins to take out his money and puts it back six months after it ends. How much money would each investor finish with by 2019? Housel explains that between 1900 and 2019 there were 1,428 months, with a little over 300 of them being recessions. Because Sue paid the price for 22% more time, when the economy was near or in a recession, she made a third more than Jim or Tom. So if we too accept the highs and lows of investing, we'll be more likely to reap the rewards. The main ideas, chapter 4. If you want to reap the rewards of investing, you have to pay the price. The stock market's price is not only in dollars or cents, but also in the volatility and fear of a fluctuating market. If you accept the highs and lows of the stock market, you're more likely to make more money. Chapter 5 The Seduction of Pessimism We all have a common bias that may affect how we think about money, pessimism. Whether you've lost your job or you've lost money, it's easy to feel pessimistic about the future. But if you look back across the years, you can see that things have generally gotten better. For example, after World War II Japan experienced economic, social, and political devastation. And then in 1946, it faced a famine so terrible that people had to subsist on 800 calories a day. Housel asks us to imagine the following news article as though it were written during that time. Most Japanese people would think the writer of that article was insane. That's because many of us perceive pessimism as intelligent and think optimism sounds like a sales tactic. And yet, in the case of Japan, this optimistic outlook was correct. Why are we so quick to embrace pessimism over optimism? And how does it affect how we deal with money? Key idea we're prone to pessimism because good things take time. Pessimism is attractive and common, especially when it comes to money, for a few reasons. First off, money matters to all of us. So when something bad happens in the economy, we're likely to pay attention. For example, even though only 2.5% of Americans owned stock in 1929, the entire country was devastated when the market crashed. This still applies today. Even though only roughly half of Americans own stock, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is a common metric for how the economy is doing. Another reason why pessimism is so pervasive, Housel explains, is that bad news tends to have a clearer arc. This is likely because there are many overnight tragedies, but few overnight miracles. So optimistic narratives are harder to construct because they have to encompass a wider swath of time. For example, we're likely to quickly notice a 40% decline in the stock market over six months. But a 140% gain over six years might go unnoticed because it happens incrementally. Although pessimism is attractive, it's important to remember that good things, especially when it comes to money, take time. Furthermore, we don't need to be pessimistic to be practical. Instead we can be optimistic as Housel defines it, a belief that the odds of a good outcome are in your favor over time even if there are setbacks along the way. So when the nightly news highlights another blow to the economy, you can remember that things generally trend upwards. The main ideas, chapter 5. Many of us are prone to pessimism, 
but history shows things tend to get better. Pessimism about money is common because any negative news affects all of us. Optimistic narratives are harder to construct because they require more time to show, whereas bad outcomes can happen overnight. Chapter 6 Your Money Now that you know some common biases and misconceptions about money management, what's next? In this final section, we'll cover a few of Housel's recommendations of what you should do with your money. Key idea If you save money, you'll be better prepared for inevitable surprises. There are few financial factors in your control, but saving money is one of them. Housel encourages you not to save for a specific reason, like a vacation or big house. Instead, start saving now in preparation for life's inevitable surprises, such as getting laid off. In fact, the thing you're likely to need the extra money for you won't be able to predict. So prepare for the gap in the future between what you think will happen and what can actually happen. Housel calls this room for error. Housel personally saves as though future returns will be one-third less than what average returns have been historically. Key idea nobody cares as much about what you own as you do, so don't spend money on fancy possessions. To save money, stop trying to buy possessions for the sole purpose of impressing others. Housel explains it this way, saving money is the gap between your ego and your income. So to save money, embrace humility. Also, in all likelihood, your fancy possessions don't really matter to anyone but you. For example, whenever you see someone in a nice car, you generally don't think, what an impressive person. It's more likely you think, wow, I'd love a car like that. So if you're looking for respect and admiration, you're more likely to find it in other ways. Key idea make financial decisions by asking yourself what will help you sleep at night. Beyond saving money, it's important to make financial decisions that make sense to you. Housel calls, does this help me sleep at night, the best universal guidepost for financial decisions. Make financial decisions that you feel good about, whether that's chasing high returns in the stock market or not investing at all. For example, Housel and his partner paid for their house out of pocket, rather than take out a mortgage. Though this might sound crazy to others, it helps them sleep at night. Housel and his partner can go to bed knowing they own their house and don't need to worry about making payments.